On today's starting nine, Jake and Carl get into a loaded weekend that saw them travel around, have some fun, hang out with some superstars. Speaking of superstars, we're joined by Bill Goldberg today to talk about his life in professional wrestling, transition to fatherhood, and his son, who is a standout high school Texas baseball player. There's plenty of action. The Braves got their ass kicked. The Yankees are struggling. There's never been a time to have a great show. Let's jump into it. This is starting nine. Action! And welcome back to Starting Nine, uh, the official baseball show hosted by Barcel Sports. It's Carl here in Chicago. And I'm joined this week by two sleeveless individuals, Jake Arietta and Bill Goldberg of, uh, of amazing international stardom. But right now I got Jake. What's going on, dude? Oh, man, back in Austin. Uh, spent a few days in Chicago playing a member guest. I, we didn't really you know, have time to get anything done. I was too busy to get my ass kicked on the golf course. Um, but yeah, back. That looking didn't forward sound to, like it went too well. No, it it wasn't great. Uh, we won. We went one and seven or two. No, uh, two and five. Yeah, we didn't play great. But that's all right. I have met a lot of cool people. Uh, didn't win shit. Uh, I won. A, I won part of the raffle. A uh, bottle of whiskey. Outside of that. Went home empty-handed. Uh, member guests are notorious for door prizes. Your member guest was in a relatively affluent part of Chicago. I am hoping for a good door prize. What'd you guys get? We got some merch from, uh, uh, what's the name of the company? Um, we, I don't know. We got, some, we got some nice golf stuff. Got some polos, got some vests, a pair of pants, a pair of shoes, a couple hats. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, four or $500 worth of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they took care of us. You playing any golf this weekend? So I was supposed to play golf with my father-in-law yesterday on Sunday for my wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Mrs. Carl. I'd set this thing up with Happy father-in-law. Birthday. My parents came up. Yeah, it's huge. We celebrate birthdays very, very hard. Um, got rained out, so we went to the casino instead and just absolutely hammered the sports book, hammered the video poker. Uh, that's a good crew. Like any with blackjack? my parents, my in-laws. No blackjack tables are filled and uh, minimum $50 table minimums on a Sunday with my in-laws is not how I want them to like, like it's they know steep. that that guy's there with me, but yeah, they're just, they don't want to see that guy on a Sunday afternoon with their daughter. So yeah, well that, that. that's kind of another cool thing. Yeah. That's how we handled. We, that's what we played in, in Omaha. Uh, I mean, it didn't get too out of hand. We actually both won money that night. Yeah. A little bit. I think. When you say both, I think it's I think it's you and your buddy Ricky took home some cash. I uh, I was paying for drinks. That's the way I kind of see it. You know, I'm gonna sit down for a couple hours, um, make my money back. But I, honestly, I do. I want to take a second. I I almost never talk about her, and for good reason. And it's gonna stay that Mama? way. But I will say, yeah, happy birthday to Mama. She's uh, absolutely. She's a special yeah. lady. She's a very special lady, and she lets me do all. People are always interested. So she met Silvana this weekend, who is dating Dave Portnoy. People know that. And we were out at the club on Saturday. And when I say club, the Barstool River North Bar in Chicago, you guys go check that out, 14 West Hubbard Street. And I was like, Silvana, this is my wife, uh, Mrs. Carl. And she's like, no way. Like, you're married? Like, what do you mean? And she's like, ask me, she's like, how are you married to a Barstool guy? And she's like, it's fun. This is how it's always been. And it was just like the, 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 you've got to be kidding me that this guy's married. It's like, no, absolutely. So shout out Mrs. Carl. So what are, are Barstool guys not expected to be married to nice, to nice women or what? Uh, we're just more like, we're like internet creatures. Like we're just, we're wrecking. We're like, we just live very public. Like everything in my life is public. Like everything I do, everywhere I go, public, everything is like very a, selfish yeah, lives or like, what? Hey, look, we're doing this. We're doing that. Like, Friday night, go to the Elton John concert at Soldier Field, Skybox with Dave and a couple of our UFC fighters, Patty the Batty and, and Meatball Molly. And I have to tell Mrs. Carl, like, hey, sorry, this is kind of a work thing, and it's just us. Like, there's high rollers. I got to go do – like, I'm going to be out tonight. And a lot, of, a lot of people would be like, what the fuck, or I want to go, or whatever. She's like, yeah, knock your socks off. Like, come home whenever. Don't be an asshole. Uh, I'm probably going to be sleeping. She yeah, gets like, it. She's cool with it. So that's why I say, like, there's just a lot of – the duality of, uh, of, of like, and we talk about this with Bill Goldberg a little bit in this interview. It's cool. Like the duality of like, you have to do stuff and put, put on. And then at the end of the day, you're, you know, you still want to be a good, a good family guy. He wants to be a good dad. He wants to be there for his, you know, for his son, which is a really cool interview to have Bill join the show in a little bit. 
Yeah, and you can just tell, just if you scroll through his Instagram just a little bit, you see all the videos he's posting of of Gage, you know, playing baseball or training for football. And, you know, we kind of get into that, and it's very unique being here in Texas. You're expected, almost expected as a, as a good athlete to play multiple sports and baseball, football, and sometimes basketball specifically. And it's a hard transition going from spring baseball now to fall football, but baseball still is, it's still going on and there's still going to be some practices and tournaments. So it's, it's hard to navigate that because Cooper right now is practicing Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, full pad football. And then trying to sprinkle in a little bit of baseball activity around that. He just had a, uh, he, he played seven games yesterday, uh, flag. He had a flag tournament. They lost uh, in the championship game. So they went six and one. The team that they lost to won the national championship last year. So, and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get to that, you know, when you guys start having kids, it's just, it's tough. You want them to do whatever they want and you want them to play all of it. And Goldberg was is right when he said, you know, Gage is now in his third year of tackle football. And you just don't want him to get hurt. You don't want him to get hurt. And I don't know if you had any any concussions as a kid. I know I had at least one or two. So you just, you know, that at the end of the day, you just want him to stay healthy. Yeah, he's been through it. We're going to get to that interview um, later in the show. Obviously, super cool. Thanks for setting that up, Jake. And uh, some some really cool guy stuff there about being like monsters and shit. I have a guy tip that I wanted to share from the weekend. This is the first time I've done something. Uh, I thought it was a smooth move. It went over very well, received very well. Saturday was the night we went out for dinner for the birthday, but I had to go to the Barstool River North Bar because we had the UFC fighters in and we were doing like a big party promotion thing with Patty and Molly. And so I go to Mrs. Carl, I'm like, hey, I know we're going to go out Saturday night for your birthday, but we have to be at the bar like 8 to 10, 8 to 11, which is obviously a sweet spot to be out for dinner. So we did two big fancy dinners. We did a dinner at 5 p.m. at Momotoro, which is like a, a Japanese high-end place, which is pretty hard to get a table at. And then we finished with an 11 p.m. restaurant or reservation at uh, – at like this fancy, super fancy upscale place called Armitage Ale House. And I don't know if I've ever done a smarter move because when we sat down for the second dinner, we were so hungry and it was like, oh my God, you're a genius for pulling two big reservations. First time I ever did it. If there's somebody out there setting up a, a, a birthday dinner for next week, don't be afraid to pull two. Yeah, that's a good move. And then sometimes you have to do two birthday dinners with two different groups of people. Right. Like a couple of friends over here. You got some family. So and it's, you know, I got some friends, some of our girlfriends, they like to have a birthday week. I don't know if that's if that's a selfish thing to do when it's my birthday. I'm like, whatever, like you, let's let's go to dinner. No big deal. But uh, tell me birthday, happy birthday once. And that's it. That's enough. That's all I need. <laughs> I don't need it. I don't need the group. You know, how are you? How are you with your birthday? Do you do you like to be sucked off for your birthday? Like, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, do, I feel like men aren't like that as much as, as women are. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but, um, I, I'm not a big fan of celebrating my birthday. I, I like celebrating other birthdays, but come on, I'm, we're in our mid thirties. Do we really need to do that anymore? No, I think you have to do a big send off for the 30th party. Like if you're, if you're, once you turn 30, like that's your last chance to throw a big party till you're 40 until you're 50. And then you just do it every 10 years. Um, I, for, I forget it's like, it'll be March 14th and I'll be like, Oh, my birthday's in two days. Like I, I should probably make sure I'm available because people are going to be expecting to like, you know, my parents are going to want to eat dinner. Somebody's going to want to do something. So you want to be available for that. But uh, presents, like you're probably this way. Like there isn't anything you don't like, if you want something, you're just going to go get it. And Brittany gets mad at me for that. She's like, I can't buy you shit. Cause when you want something, you just end up going to buy it. Uh, and like, get, I, I like to do this with gifts instead of just, you know, the, the obvious days like birthday or Christmas or Valentine's day. I just like random gifts for people, you know, throughout the year, just sp spontaneous gift giving, uh, is a, is a skill. And I think that people need to need to learn how to do that a little bit more like, yeah, the chocolates and, and, and flowers on Valentine's day. I don't need to be told uh, when to do that for my wife. So I might just randomly, you know, today go buy her some, some shit, you know, some flowers or some chocolates and, and just, you know, let her know I love her. 
when I was leaving my old sales job for Bar Solo Golf all time, a young guy that I had been training for a couple of years gave me, this is one of the nicest gifts anybody's ever given me. That's why I'm telling you the story. But it's not a family member. It's not just like a guy I was working with for a while. We're still friends. And he gave me a portable phone charger. And he was like, you're going to be on your phone 10 hours a day. You're going to need a charge. When you need a charge and, like, you're down and you plug this baby in, whether it's a Bears game or a Cubs game, he's like, I'm always there to give you a little boost, buddy. And it was like a nice fucking note. I was, like, moved. I mean, this thing probably cost 15 bucks. could get it at Best Buy. But it was just so packaged, so nice. And to this day, I use that phone charger. I bring it. It's like I'm, it was with us in Los Angeles. You saw me. I was sitting in the. You stand had it. Sharing. You had it. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of those things. It's like that's a gift you can give to somebody. You know, in the middle of the year on a Tuesday, like, hey, I was thinking about you. I know your phone's almost. It's almost dead all the time. So here you go. Enjoy that. And uh, yeah, I I don't have a good one. And every, everybody needs that. Like if you have like a, if you're a backpack guy or a fanny pack guy, that's one of those little things that can fit in there with your charging cable, you know, that, uh, that you, you'll be glad you have, you know, you got your firearm, your knife, your charger <laughs> and chapstick. <laughs> and chapstick. Yeah. Don't leave home without it. Uh, okay. Speaking of dead phones, my phone is alive and well, the Atlanta Braves are not. So this is the, one of the biggest series of the year to date with the Braves coming into the, to, uh, to City Field, Scherzer is pitching, DeGrom is pitching. And probably well, there's some takeaways from this series. I'm going to start with the primary one. Edwin Diaz's walkout song, The Trumpets, Narcos, this thing has caught fire. Uh, good on the Mets for putting together that high, like that crazy 4K or 10K video or whatever of him jogging out from the bullpen. I think people saw it firsthand and got like a, a holy shit. Not only is Edwin Diaz the most dominant closer in baseball right now, he has the most dominant walkout song, walkout presentation. It gives me the chills. It gives me hope for baseball. I loved it. I love everything. Yeah, walkout songs are extremely important. Extremely important. And for starting, well, for any pitcher, you come in the game, you get – you get an extended listen to that walkout song. You know what I mean? Instead of, you know, the, the batters, they get maybe 10, 15 seconds of their song. So Diaz picked an amazing song for his entrance. And you have to do that for your closer. You throw something up on the board, you got flames, you got fireworks, whatever, whatever it is, you're setting the tone, you're setting the mood for not only the stadium, but for Diaz. You, you want to get him loose. You want to get him pumped up. And yeah, he's he's extremely dominant. You know, he had a down year, what, a couple years ago or whatever, and people were talking shit. Like, no, this guy, this guy's for real. And uh seeing seeing the the Mets fans do the chop, you know, at City Field. I, I know Colin loved that. I, I, I got a kick out of that myself. It's an absolute ass kicking start to finish. And for the Braves, they've um, you know, really been waiting for this moment to come in and they'd had their moment momentum in the second half. And the Mets have just been hanging on and do, doing their damage without their without their star one, two. And now you finally see it. It's, Jacob DeGrom struck out 12 and five and a third, and he now has the most strikeouts through 200 starts uh, in any player in Major League history. And it's crazy. I went and looked at Nolan Ryan's. Nolan Ryan made his 200th start when he was 27 years old. It's unfortunate DeGrom's 34. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, it was just – Need, need this man to stay healthy. And if just judging by, yeah, he's had some injuries uh, here and there, but you look at the guy's velocity and how he's increased his strength and, and his stuff every year of his career just about. And we, we've, we've uh, I think, had conversations about that, how it's extremely rare for that to happen. It usually goes the other way. So, I mean, he could pitch for another. I mean, if look at Scherzer, look at Verlander. Uh, he's, he's in that cat type of category, obviously. And hopefully he can just, you know, maintain what he's doing. He seems, he seems to be really mobile and that's something that guys lose over time. He still got it. I, I say another six, seven years from DeGrom. Uh, but yeah, no one's, no one's really going to, going to have those types of numbers and, and be able to compare with a guy like Nolan or, you know, Clemens or Randy Johnson, some of those strikeout numbers. It's just, it seems unattainable in today's game. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of reasons and factors. The depth of the competition and the stress of, of each moment at bat, I think, is obviously different and keeps getting – the hitters in baseball are better than they were. Like, I'm not saying they're bigger, stronger, faster. I don't really like that argument. I think guys are 
you know, like you could take a Willie Mays. I, Willie Mays plays in any era. I think that like the absolute top of the top. But what you're seeing is like the 25th guy on a major league roster is significantly better now than he was 10, 15 years ago at changing a game, 20, 30 years ago at being dynamic enough to get into a starting lineup. Before, dude, there's guys that had carved out major league careers that literally would not hit for extra base power ever. Ever, but they had careers because guy plays short, plays second. He's a good team guy. Can sack bunt. Like just the dynamic and in, in the way people have judged players to get to the big leagues, you have like more depth in the dynamic talent. But who knows if that makes it a better product in the long run? Like if you look at the Cubs roster, they have guys on the bottom of the roster that have like big time talent power, but they're not like refined ball players. We could go back. It's like this guy's never in a thousand years would be considered polished enough to be in the big leagues or I shouldn't say in a thousand years but you understand like just the 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 trajectory in which people say this guy is a major league baseball player and is qualified to play I think his I think has definitely changed and uh and it's changed quickly the training has changed so drastically like look Cooper started training about a year ago like like really training lift like moving weight and working on his agility his foot speed that wasn't that wasn't a thing back then. Like kids at ten were, you know, they're playing sports, but they were focused really on their nutrition and and how to how to increase their speed or or their power. I mean, was there anybody doing that? Maybe, but every kid in little league or pee wee football is getting some sort of specific training to help their sport. All of them. Like there's boot camps that go on around the neighborhood around the Austin area the kids were doing all summer long Monday through Friday or no Monday, Wednesday, Friday at like 6 a.m. training with high school kids. Like it's just, it's like clockwork. It's just, it's, uh, it's almost like if you're not doing that type of stuff, you're going to be behind. So that the level of training has increased so, so much that, uh, but yeah, I, I do think kids are bigger, faster, stronger in a sense. The one thing that, that has kind of maintained over, over time, a specific time in the past several decades is, is, you know, velocities might have gone up a tick, but if you look at like other sports and how records are broken in like track and field and all these other sports, like there are leaps and bounds above where they were, you know, half a century ago. Why haven't, why haven't we seen a guy throw 115, 120 miles an hour yet? You know, like if, if things were on that same trajectory as other sports, and I saw this in that fastball documentary, like the Jesse Owens, you know, Olympic records that he set. I mean, those are like high school numbers now. Literally high school kids are running that fast. So if you would equate that to, to our sport, you would think that you'd, you would see somebody throw 112 or 115 miles an hour yet. Or maybe the human body just isn't capable of that sort of stress. I don't know. What do you think? I think you're seeing depth in the velocity. Like I think the – the number of guys that are carrying velocity deep, but as far as these anomalies, we could be a generation away from it. You know, there's a kid from Tennessee that's throwing 104. I think what you're seeing is like the the uniformity in training. Okay, so when I was at Illinois playing, I would have done anything that you would have told me would have added velocity to my game. So when I got there and they gave us the the workout program, yes, anybody that would play with me, they would have said, Carl fucking filed that program harder and better and tighter than like anybody in the program at that time. Where I, anything they told me to do, I was doing it. Part of that's because I was a walk on like who needed to do that stuff. But the also thing was like deep down, I was, this is my, I'll do anything you guys asked me to do. I got significantly bigger and stronger it never added to the mound. Like, I got tougher. I had way more confidence my senior year. I was a fucking – I didn't give a sh – I would have pitched in, like, any circumstances. And that's how I, had like, had mentally developed myself through the training. But it had never paid off in any type of physical benefit. And then it's maybe half a decade later with the guys at Driveline that are doing the weighted velocity stuff where it's, like, proven methods and metrics. If that was going on when I was playing baseball, I would have been the first guy buying the plyometric balls and bringing them in there. And I think it's just, like, now that you know that that stuff's out there, that it's not – and not to say just Driveline, but there's, like, proven methods to gain velocity to make your slider sharper. Not just go throw a bullpen and work on staying back. Like, here's the exact drills that you guys are doing. His kind of – now here's where it has happened. This goes back to the Brett's mate, the Brett's, the Mets Brave series, <laughs> is 
You have a guy like Spencer Strider is a perfect example. Um, I'm not saying he was made in a lab, but when you have a generation of pitchers or, or this large population of young pitchers that are very much developed in a lab, then you are having guys on the yeah. mound that are like disconnected from results. So Sp Spencer Strider loses to the Mets and then says to the media afterwards, a lot of weird hits. They seem to be having a lot of luck right now offensively. That's great. It's August. He talks about exit velocities. He talks about just the randomization. And this is shit you would have never heard 10 years ago in the big leagues. But because of the data and the way these guys are developed, it's in their head that like, oh, well, I was making good pitches yeah. because that's what the data says. It's not their fault because that's what everybody around them is talking about. Look, I mean, if you – hitting – Hitting is the hardest thing to do in sports. And if they're hitting good pitches, that's going to happen sometimes. But let, let's be more realistic about, about what happened. Like, if you didn't pitch well, you didn't pitch well, man. Like, and that guy's got an, an electric fastball. He's got amazing stuff. So, like, I, there's no, I don't know if he's making excuses. I would have had to, had to see it. But no, I, I mean, it, I would see it quite often where somebody would get up there in the media and talk about how they just they they hit great pitches and they they threw it where they wanted to and it just didn't work out. Okay, once in a while a guy's going to guy's going to hit a, a great pitch and and take you deep, but no, I, I don't I don't like it at all. You know, I, I I prefer to hear guys say I didn't throw well tonight, you know, they got the best of me. I don't really care for to hear the exit velocity talk or the the defensive positioning. You got beat. Just you know, take it on the chin and and move on. Now, comparatively, friend of the program Dansby Swanson met with the media, and he had this to say: "I think the initial reaction, obviously, is we did not play well, really, in any phase. If you take out two innings of the second game of the series, if you take out that, we obviously did not play well in all phases of the game, really." And People listen to this, you've heard Dansby Swanson on our show. That's an old school throwback guy who just wants to go out and win. And that's what we're talking about. The difference between like that's what Dansby Swanson has to say about dropping four out of five to New York versus Spencer Strider, a guy who put up two awesome starts in the second half, went out for his third start against the Mets and just frankly didn't pitch well. He lasted, didn't didn't get out of the third inning. I understand why he'd be frustrated, but you know, it's like just different messaging about why you lose, why you win. Be interesting. Spencer Strider is supposed to be front runner for National League Rookie of the Year, or in that conversation, I should yeah, say. Yeah, he's he's very very nice arm, very nice arm. Yeah, and it was a frustrating series uh, for the Braves, and obviously we love Dansby, but you know you you can't take out two innings of the game. You can't, you know, like you, that's that's why you play nine. Uh, you might play great for six, and then you and then you play like shit for three. That's why we play all of them. You see what I mean? And, you know, <laughs> the results are what they are at the end of the game. Uh, but, yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't, a great, wasn't a great series for the Braves. Um, they'll be all right. I mean, they're, they're six and a half back now, which is tough. And we've always said, you know, the Mets are, Mets are taking this division. And climbing out of that hole is going to be hard for them now. Colin, do you have a word on the Mets? I've decided to uh, let your Collins Corner be sponsored by Roman this week. I mean, you guys summed it up pretty good. It was just awesome to see DeGrom back on the mound, take four out of five against the Braves. It's the biggest biggest series uh, this season so far. Um, the Mets have shown that they're not falling out of this division, and they're not going to make it easy for the Braves to get back in it, just like Jake said. So I yesterday was a special day. This weekend was a special weekend. This team is rolling right now. Like, it just feels – good to be in a Mets fan right now and you don't get to say that often but this team is special and I love what Buck Showalter's do yeah just he's that's a reiter reiterated message the entire season and he's right he's right Buck Buck's the man it's got to be a good time to uh to be a Mets fan yeah for sure I mean, the vibes are riding high. Testosterone throughout the the Mets fan base is there, and uh, and that's a good reason to bring up our friends over at Roman as we listen to Colin get rock hard about the Mets' uh, future coming in the playoffs. Ooh. 
Uh, testosterone is an important part of a man's body and health, but men's testosterone starts to deplete with age, which is why it's important you support it early. Signs of low T can include a decline in energy and stamina, weight gain, hair loss, and a low sex drive. Roman's testosterone support supplements were designed by real doctors to help men maintain the body's natural testosterone production. The daily supplement includes six nutrients to help support testosterone levels, bone health, and muscle development. Who wouldn't want to have the proper levels of testosterone in their body. Go to GetRoman.com slash starting nine to get $15 off your first order of Roman T support. That's GetRoman.com slash starting. GetRoman.com slash starting. Uh, we've talked about Roman a lot at Barstool Sports. This stuff's very effective. Um, in this case, we're talking T supplements. If you've used their swipes before, you know the effectiveness. Go check out the T supplements. Again, that's uh, GetRoman.com slash starting. GetRoman.com slash starting for $15 off your first order. I'm rock hard for the Dodgers. <laughs> Sorry, Padres. Juan Soto is mic'd up last night just in right field. It's sad watching him see just bombs fly out. I mean, just all the hoopla, the trade deadline, and then it's like you still got to beat the Dodgers. It's tough, man. They're so good. They're so good. Still, yep, still, still got to beat the Dodgers. It looks really good on paper, but that, that's why you play the games. I don't – I mean, look, that's okay. I think that uh, – I think the Padres are, are still a huge force. I mean – You'd be you'd be stupid not to. But you're right though. The Dodgers are the team to beat, and they've shown that year after year. I mean, it's tough when they outscore you twenty to four in three games, and everybody's watching those games. I, I know that the Padres are going to take some time to get their the group and the fluidity, and um, you know, just playing together and stuff. Now that you've got this this big superstar, I don't think it clicks right away. But um, it is just. <sighs> It's it's tough when you make quite literally the biggest trade in the history of Major League Baseball and you still can't say conclusively that you're the best team in your division. It is tough. That's just how good the Dodgers are. That's how good the Dodgers are. I think that um I think the pitching for the Padres, I mean look, I think Snell Snell needs to be better. I mean, he's he's a Cy Young type of guy. He needs to pitch a little bit better. Musgrove is a stud. You can't give up 20 runs. Tough to win if you give up 20 in a series. No. And opposite that, it's like the Dodgers are rolling. The Yankees slump a little bit. They have to go to St. Louis and play a three-game series on a weekend. You know Bush Stadium was just rocking for the Yankees to come in. And that Jordan Montgomery start was awesome. He had some shit to say. He was like, I've always been that good. He was not happy about that trade. No, I, didn't, I mean I didn't see his uh, I didn't see his comments. What did he say? He was basically just saying that uh, you know the the I'll pull it up exactly. Hold on a second here. I can't pull the exact quote. I know he's disappointed. His his, his fiance had like medical residency plans figured out in New York and so, like serious hard hitting stuff that hits a guy like that where he's like, dude, my family, everything's getting uprooted right now. But Matt Carpenter came out and there was a really cool story about Matt Carpenter coming to Jordan Montgomery and, and telling him how well he's going to fit with St. Louis, how much that fan base is going to embrace him. It's a great opportunity. You love hearing stories like that. Yeah. I mean, Car Carp's a pro and uh, I, I know it was hard for him to, to leave uh, St. Louis, but you know, to kind of stick with it. And, uh, you know, he was with the Rangers. He ended up opting out. And it, c it couldn't have been a better fit for him to go to the Yankees. Uh, and already such a, a great team there. And he brings a lot. He brings a lot to the Yankees. And uh, he loves being there. It's cool to see, too. There was a, like Nolan Arenado made a great play in his first start. You got to imagine like Jordan Montgomery's on the mound feeling a little bit different about what's in front of him with St. Louis. I, I obviously you don't want to leave a team that's in first place and having this historic season with the Yankees, those guys in the clubhouse and everything. But I mean, it's, it's about as good as it gets as like a pitcher, a guy who's working a contact and putting the defense in play. It's like, all right, here's literally the one of the greatest third basemen of all time. Um, put up a good start. I feel like he's part of the he's part of the the story of the show for the rest of the year. Like I will have my eye on Jordan Montgomery. And could you imagine if he gets a chance to pitch in Yankee Stadium in a World Series game? Uh, oh, man, the juices would be flowing for that one. Just yeah, I can't imagine it. I absolutely can. Um, opposite that, here's a great one for you. The Angels hit seven home runs over the weekend. They lost a game. I'm willing to say that the Angels are going to finish behind the Oakland Athletics in the AL West standing is like the most embarrassing four or five finish um, in recent memory. 
Man, they're just not good at all. They did. I just saw they uh, they did draft Ben Joyce, so maybe he can come up and save the team. <laughs> he got drafted in the third round. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? How does that guy get drafted in the third round? I don't know. Maybe there's something we're missing, but he looks to me like a guy you could bring up in September and have him pitch for you in the postseason. And for our, like, I, I don't know what I'm missing. For our non-diehards, Ben Joyce is the uh, guy from Tennessee we were just talking about in the velocity development. You've seen yeah, this guy throwing in the 113. Air, throwing yeah, he's just an absolute beast. But who who is – how many other relief pitchers got drafted ahead of him? I want to see what that list of guys look like because you have to be just such a G if you got drafted fast, like higher than Ben Joyce. <laughs> yeah, you must have been really good. I know there was a, the left-handed starter from Oregon State – um was in the middle of the first round let's see i got it right here brock porter uh he's from orchard lake st mary's high school kid it seems like we've got uh dylan lesko right-handed pitcher out of buford georgia looks like a high school kid there's a bunch of guys brandon Bar barriera a high school kid from florida robbie snelling Another high school kid, Jackson Ferris, the IMG Academy of Florida, left-handed pitcher. So, I mean, seven, eight, nine. Uh, he had a teammate, Blake uh, Tidwell, right-handed pitcher from Tennessee. Quite a bit, man. Quite a few. Dude, that's yeah, crazy, I don't, I don't know. man. That ball's got to be straight. Bunch. I would like to see, although it would be fun to see a guy like that go into the big leagues and just get his shit rocked for like a day or something, just like. Like where he's, it's like, see, he throws 103. Been sitting around all college season, seeing this guy on the internet, and it's like, now nah, here's a bunch of, <laughs> here's a bunch of dudes in like the middle of the Oakland Athletics lineup who just wouldn't care. You haven't even heard of that would just tee off all over that guy. I don't know. His shit ain't straight. I'll tell you that. I've seen, I've seen him throw. You've seen him throw. It's his shit's moving. He's got a changeup and a slider. I, I don't know. Maybe health concerns. Okay, he was drafted 112. There was, I mean, dude, there's like 60 pitchers drafted before this guy. Uh, whatever, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a scout. I'm not a cross checker, a GM. So I, I'm sure they, they saw something there. But I think that guy needs to be pitching in the postseason this year. Well, that'd be cool if like, and there was a rule where MLB was like, you have to have somebody you just drafted on every postseason roster, and they have to appear in like every other game. <laughs> That would be a terrible rule. <laughs> that would ruin the game. No, just a guy. Guys aren't ready for that. Most guys wouldn't be ready for that. And you wouldn't want to put a guy in that in that position to, like, in the postseason. Maybe bring him up in September on a shitty team, but postseason, I don't know. Is that awkward in the postseason when those guys come up in September and, and the rosters get expanded? Are there guys that have been there all season that start to look around and are like, "Wait a second, are they trying to see if this guy is replacing me to be a base dealer?" That'll happen. Yeah, that'll happen, sure. But ultimately, the the team is looking for the best players to help them win. And if it is, I mean, we had a – I think we brought in – we brought in Quentin Berry, who's now, I believe, he's the first at third base coach with the Brewers. But we brought him in to, like, be a, a stolen base threat for us. And sometimes somebody's got to go. He's a utility guy or or a bullpen arm that may, may or may not have been with the team the majority of the season. But, hey, we need a guy to come in in a big situation and, and score from second on a hit or, or go first to third or, or steal a bag. And, you know, at times that's more valuable than having a guy that you're probably not going to get into games unless, you know, they're injuries. So uh, it, guys do look around the clubhouse, especially even on losing teams when you're, bring, you're expanding the roster and there's young guys that are coming up, they're recent draft picks, and you got some older guys in the big leagues that are like, well, shit, now, like, this guy's going to play over me. Uh, you know, it looks like your days are numbered, but that's the, that's the nature of the beast in professional sports. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, I, I also think it's important. We're going to get to this Bill Goldberg or, uh, interview, but be, before we do, I do want to give some, I do give some credit to Adley Rushman. We've talked about him a little bit in the show and calling him out, but I don't know if you can do a better job debuting as a number one overall pick who's just been waiting to get called up is the bedrock of this team right now. And it seems like the Orioles fans are really buying into what's going on there. Every Orioles fan that I follow on Twitter that I'm like connected with, like the excitement is just through the roof for Baltimore. 
And there's so many of these lingering fan bases, not just in Major League Baseball, but across professional sports. And there's just something really wholesome, even not as an Orioles fan, but just seeing like what that does and invigorate the stadium. They're selling out now. The place is rocking. And it's cool that you can go back. And, and of course, it takes a team and all the stuff. But for Adley Rushman to like step up, embrace it, and he just looks like a guy who's going to be around the big leagues for a while. You know, as a fan, it's hard to not watch that and feel like, all right, good. We got the Orioles going. Like, good. We got that team running. They're, they're up and running. Um, and it's it's an exciting team to follow, I think, for the rest of the season, see how this shakes up, especially with them trading Mancini and Lopez. Um, and as they stand now, they're like a game out. Two of the games out. Two games out of the wild card. Um, Rutschman is – he's just – it's very reminiscent of Matt Wieters, just a, a pillar of the team behind the plate, a guy who um, has a really good head on his shoulders, takes his job title very, very seriously. And, um, you know, a quote that I saw – of some of Weeder's advice to Adley was, you know, um, play hard, play often, and play for your teammates. That's just – that's a very typical thing to hear from a guy like Matt Weeders. And, um, you know, the Orioles are in really good hands, especially, um, you know, in, in, w with that position being filled by a guy like Adley for the foreseeable future. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice bright spot for the Orioles, and I, I would love to see them sneak into a wild card. I think that would be a really cool story. I don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah, but. that that three the opening round three game series the the one game they'd get at uh, at Camden Yards or I I don't I got to figure out how that the home away shakes up for the three game series and in, in the, with the wild cards but um, I'm looking at the National League I'm trying to figure out who the National League team is that's trying to do the Orioles stuff and I don't see one I think it's just I think at this point if you're a National League fan and you have to accept that you're not – and you're not a Dodgers, a Mets, a Padres. And I'm sorry, Braves fans. You guys just got spanked. You guys have some time time to really think about what that home series is going to look like with the Mets. But it, it's, it's slim pickings on the National League. The American League is still staying very much exciting to me because especially when you see the Yankees get swept like they did, if that, that should be a little bit of like a – it just should be like a little bit of a breathing room if you know if you're like a, if you're an Astros fan obviously like this is an opportunity where they could they could keep moving forward and be the number one seed going into October which would be crazy with how much the national media sucked the Yankees dick all year. There's a couple teams that could be shuffled in and out of that National League wild card spot though. I mean Philly's right there, San Diego, Milwaukee obviously. I mean San Fran, I don't think you can completely count them out of it. So. There's four or five teams that could they could be shuffled around. I mean, in in Philly, I, yeah, they're nine and one in the last ten. I kind of thought that they were, you know, on the on the downslide and and not even going to be able to recover and have a shot to make the postseason. But they're right there. You know, they made a couple nice trades. Um, so yeah, I think there's still some excitement uh, within the National League wild card spot. Maybe maybe what happened to Atlanta kind of. Lights a fire under them a little bit. I mean, but they're historically, they're, it's a veteran, it's a winning culture there. I mean, I, I wouldn't worry too much about them unless they're playing the Mets. Well, well said. I'm also interested for the Phillies. They could be, like, I know Bryce has been out since June, but they're 9-1 and one over the last 10. Like I said, they just scored 36 runs in four games against the Nationals. They've got another very, very winnable series coming up here um, against the Marlins, who just lost a series to – to the Cubs. So, you know, the Phillies are one of these teams where the, the thunder is there in that lineup. Defensively, they're a little weak, but when you have Aaron Nola and Wheeler at the top of your rotation, don't, you know, like I know the Mets are a better team over 162 games, but you know, Wheeler and Nola can go out and give you a game that like maybe Schwarber runs into a couple and, and it's not as much like that as a matchup. If you're a Mets fan, maybe you get a little like, we don't want to see the Phillies in the, in the NLDS. Hmm. No, and we'll see what the timeline is like with Harper. I mean, I know he's fucking doing everything in his power to get back on the field. He'd probably play today if if, if they would let him. Yeah, <laughs> when you have Nolan Wheeler, those guys those guys can they can legitimately shut out anybody. Like when they're when they're on, I mean, Nola's command is just it's as good as as it gets in the league. He's got great great off speed. Uh, and Wheeler, Wheeler as well. Like, it just kind of like they're kind of sneaky, really, really good. And I know baseball fans know who they are, and but they, they don't get as much love as as they as they should. Uh, but but yeah, if if they're out there, I mean, they can pitch 
at or near the level of of Scherzer and Degrom. They just they just can't, you know. And they're not they're not as sexy of names, but when they're when they're on, they're really hard to beat. Speaking of hard to beat, uh, I think it's appropriate to bring in uh, to bring in our guest for today's show. Uh, Bill Goldberg, who at one time was 173 and 0 for the WCW, we uh, he's a he's, he's probably the biggest legend I've ever talked to in my life. Yeah, I mean, growing up, we talked to him a little bit, and we've had a conversation. That I wasn't like a diehard wrestling fan by any means, but I had an appreciation and like I had a fondness for guys like Stephen F. Or Stephen F. Austin. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, um, Goldberg, Nash, The Undertaker. Like, you, we just, you knew all these big names and you were just kind of fans of them without even like being a diehard wrestling fan. Um, and those guys don't really exist uh, in today's wrestling. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's great to talk to him. He's, uh, he's a good man, a great father. Um, and look forward to talking to him again. Yeah. So, Let's get to the Bill Goldberg interview, but first I want to thank our friends at Doer Jeans. It's time to simplify your wardrobe and the way you dress with Doer. They set out to create versatile staple items that can travel from a hike to work and even out to dinner. Less in the closet means less in the landfill and less time debating what to wear means more time enjoying those adventures. Guys, that means performance denim, which is signature gusset for extended range of motion and flexibility. It's it's stretch fabric, max comfort. That's like if you guys are out, you guys are going for a little hike, you guys want to be active, but you also want to like feel good and have the moisture wicked away in the heat. We're talking about performance denim. We're also talking about the no sweat shorts. If you got stinky balls like me, stretchy and comfortable. They got the fabric for wicking, for warmth, zippered pockets, secure those. Like you don't want your phone, you want your debit card flopping around. Um, how about tees? How about a 50% stronger than a regular tee with a neckline that won't get stretched out? That's very important, especially these hot, humid summer months when the fabric takes a beating. This is made with tensile fabric that allows these tees to have maximum odor neutralization, <laughs> moisture wicking, and leaves you cool and dry. And then, of course, if you guys are looking for something in the pant section, this fall, I'm telling you my number one piece to add is the No Sweat Jogger. This is the signature piece, extended range, motion, and flexibility, stretchy and comfortable. Again, this is also made with tensile, ultra light, moisture wicking, and antibacterial zipper thigh pocket. So important items don't get lost. Guys, discover the lightweight luxury of performance naturals. Whether you're a corporate climber or a mountain climber, take 15% off online at shopdoer, D U E R, shopdoer.com, or in store using code starting. Jake, I know you like the jeans. If they can neutralize my odor, then they're really on to something. I just got, I got the package in a couple of days ago. I need to try all these on, but they're beautiful. They, they, the stretchiness and being able to maintain mobility in denim is like a huge, huge plus for me. So uh, I'm really excited about it. appreciate the product. And, uh, you know, like Carl Sand, get you some Doer jeans. Neutralize your odor. Shopdoer.com. Uh, you guys... You guys won't regret it. Um, okay, so let's get to let's get to Bill Goldberg, the man who needs no introduction. Um, here we go. All right, we're in the interview portion of today's show. We're joined by uh, legend, the legend, Bill Goldberg. Uh, both you guys are sleeveless. Bill, you look great. How's the body holding up? How you feeling, man? Uh, first of all, I thought you said sleepless, and I I, <laughs> I fall in that category too. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. You know, at uh, 155 years old, and what I've put my body through, uh, the fact that I'm still walking on the earth is pretty amazing. So it's all good, man. Living life in Texas, loving it. Amen. Now, what are some Amen. what are some things that you do to like stay healthy, stay mobile? Because obviously you're a big dude. I think we're the same height, six four. You probably got me by 45 pounds. <laughs> you you. Which is a good thing. You're massive. But doing what you've done your entire career, you know, obviously you played football. You wrestled forever. You did some, some mixed martial arts type stuff, kickboxing. As you get older, things get, it gets more difficult to get out of bed and move around. Do you have a routine every day? I know you still work out a lot, but are there little things that, like yoga or Pilates that you'll mix in that might not be as mainstream just to, just to feel good? Well, being that pitcher, man, you, you certainly lobbed me a good one right there. I appreciate it. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Uh, 
you know, uh, ironically, today uh, we're coming out with a, uh, a partnership. Myself and a company called Hemp to Lab have developed these products called uh, Gallant. And, you know, man, I'm 55 years old. I put my body through absolute hell. I retired from the NFL because of lack of ability, and I tore my abdomen off of my pelvis. So I, I never thought I'd be doing much physical work right after football, let alone, you know, up until the ripe age of 55 years old. Um, but I mean, you know, we were young and we destroyed our bodies and did whatever we could do to get gigantic, you know, as far as compound lifting. And I, I was with a coach yesterday and ironically, we we're talking about an old teammate of mine, Kevin Green, God rest his soul. And, uh, you know, things have changed. Supplementation has changed. You know, training has changed so much over the years. And, I was talking to this trainer yesterday who I, I bring in town to train my son, Gage. And I mean, Kevin and I were rooming together back when liver, liver tablets were a big thing, right? And, and now they're big again. They're big again, right? but you don't have to take like 80 of them a day. <laughs> like, yeah. like I did back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the supplements are better. The, the dosages are different. Um, I think a lot of my collaboration with Gallant, uh, with Hemp to Lab, had to do with my inability to walk around as a normal human being without just wanting to scream, you know, pain-wise, uh, whether it's limping because of my knee or my inability to throw a baseball with my son because my shoulder's blown out. But whatever it may be, I'm not going to sit here and cry and bitch and moan about it. But it's it's a fact of life, especially somebody who's put their body through hell like we have. Um, so... Uh, you know, a lot of less uh, lower impact stuff. I, I still do some kickboxing stuff. Um, active participation is what I'm all about. If I can burn calories fishing, I'm going to do it. Um, so I just try to stay moving, man, and try to try to. I lift every day. Um, I certainly don't lift like I used to, but I just stay moving. The, the second that you stop and are sedentary, um, atrophy is going to set in and you're going to be as worthless as the next guy walking this planet these days. So, um, with, with, with a lower impact regimen with, with frequency of movement, which is daily and these new products, um, it's, it's a, it's a hemp based product line and no THC. They're all, all, uh, everything's regulated and tested as such food grade certified, all organic, uh, components, um, we control everything from seed to sale, so nobody touches anything that we do. Um, we come up with the formulas. Uh, the, the, the company's led by a 15-year past executive for FedEx who was more than successful in all of his ventures. And, you know, and, you know anytime you associate yourself with anything or any, any entity, especially when it comes to health and what we've done in our lives, you want to vet them as much as humanly possible, and you want to make sure that they're the top of the top of the heap. And if not, uh, you don't want to associate yourself with them. And I, I, I truly believe I found the best. And uh, whether it's communication, whether it's formulation, or whether it's distribution, or whether it's just the resume of the people involved, I, I'm I'm very honored to say that uh, today we're launching the uh, product line Gallant. Go to Made Gallant. Dot com and check it out. We got a bunch of uh, today. We actually have uh, ten free giveaways, and and I believe what they do is they go online and fill out the uh, fill out the form, and in the promo code put Jackhammer, and the first ten people who fill that in get a nice little surprise, uh, a uh, piece of uh, whether it's a piece of merchandise or whether it's a, a product itself. You know, it's a great way to launch today. And uh, I'm excited. I really am. Hey, if, if at the end of the day, it makes me live two more weeks of my life, then <laughs> I'm all in. So. Well, you know, so the information I know about it, it has, has evolved. And I think a lot of people thought that for pain relief, like you needed the THC. And that's, that's not the case. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I chewed on a few of these gummies this morning. And they got them right here. I'm going to go ahead and throw another one down. These aren't going to put me to sleep, are they? Yeah, no, they're not going to put you to sleep. They'll just chill you out, man. That's all. Okay. That's all. All right. Well, I could use that. Even all day. Good, good. And 
I'm sure you've taken, we've all taken pain pills post-surgery or injuries. And that's, we don't, we don't want that. The, neg- the negative side effects of all that is kind of pushing people away from that and into something that's yeah, like where a little do you bit begin safer. With negative side effects. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no yeah, question I mean, it just, about it. The list goes on and on. Through, every professional athlete through the, 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 you know, since the beginning of time has dealt with pain. And whether it's covering it up or whether it's uh, uh, continually putting yourself in a state of such uh, that, that you feel no pain, um, none of it's really good for you. And, it, and truly, the pain pills are just a mask. It's a temporary fix, right? And so, in all honesty, since I retired, uh, Advil's been my best go-to because it actually reduces the inflammation instead of covering up the pain itself. So it deals with the issue instead of just covering up. That's why I like the, the, these products because not only do they help with the pain, and don't cover it up, but they heal you at the same time. So um, that's a huge advantage to, to taking this route. And I think quite obviously on your liver, uh, it, it, it's a lot more forgiving. Yeah, that's where the Advil comes in with me because uh, the can- it's not like a candy coating. I just don't – Why it- Advil just has a good taste going down. So you're like, should I have two? <laughs> you know what? I'm going to have the third. And to your point, the liver stuff um, – it's not good news. So, okay, I have a confession. I did my research, Bill. Uh, I had to. You are a, a living legend. To describe you as a superhero in my childhood would be uh, would be a gross understatement. So I was just recently watching a documentary uh, published by A&E, very informative. If you haven't watched it before, I obviously recommend guys go check it out, especially – uh, the Goldberg fans that are are joining us. Something that stood out to me in the doc, and then when we started talking before we started the interview, uh, you said uh, you said a football player, you know, something about golfing and, and a football player. So to me, it seems like you really, at your core, you're still that kid from Tulsa, Oklahoma, smashing dudes' face in as a football player. Did has that left you even now as we talk about pain recovery and stuff? To this day, when you're working out, you see that kid, you know, in the '70s, just beating dudes up in Tulsa. I'll always be that kid. I, I, I will always revert back to him. Um, I continue to try to drum him up to get my son ready for his first day of football practice today. Um, yeah, man. I innately, I'm a, I'm a meat-headed defensive lineman to the day I die. Um, I love being that guy. I enjoy being that guy. It makes me extremely happy walking the streets being that guy. Um, I like to be the antithesis of that guy, quite obviously, in, in proper situations. But, yeah, man, I, I, I like to tell everybody I'm not an actor. I'm not a wrestler. I'm a football player. I'm a D lineman, and I own that, and I'm proud of that. And I will be that person to the day I die with a big smile on my face. So then really interesting in your transition from football into professional wrestling, it's like the maybe around 29, 30, you go to the WCW power plant or like kind of the training facility to get recognized. And so it's kind of funny to think about now in today's internet age, like if you wanted to get seen back then, you literally had to physically show up and fight and wrestle other dudes where today, if you want to be seen, you know, you could be popular on the internet. Um, Do you think that if you had to go back, like if you could do it today, do you think there's more of an advantage? Are you like, no, the way I did it back then, you know, with or without the internet? I think, you know, man, that lobotomizes me just thinking about that, how it would, how I would approach it today. But I, I, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I really wouldn't have, man. You know, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, if I could have sat down and forecasted my future for the next 10, 20, and now 30 years, I couldn't have, as a script writer, I couldn't have done it any better. I mean, from my career to meeting my wife on a movie that she thought she was working with Jeff Goldblum and it was Goldberg. <laughs> I mean, it, it, shit happens for a reason, man. You know, it really does. I'm a firm believer of that. So, um, I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. You'll be happy to know my cousins and I watch Santa Slay every Christmas Eve together. 
It's like in our rotation before we watch Die Hard, we put Santa Slay on. It's a it's a lab, it's a lab factory. Any any more like uh, what were the movie offers like after Longest Yard? Oh man, you know they were sporadic. I, Hollywood is really not something that I ever uh, planned on doing by any stretch of imagination. I, you know, like I said, I'm just a D lineman man that got an opportunity. And uh, anytime I can go out there and, and do some stuff, that's fine. But, man, making the transition to Texas here three years ago from San Diego, um, I mean, we've got, we've got possible series that need to be shot in L.A. three days a week. And I'm toying with that in my mind. But, um, you know, you, you talk about getting into the wrestling business when I was, you know, about 30 years old. And, Everything that was accelerated for me because I really couldn't and, and I really couldn't take advantage of the moment because I'd already been there in that moment before. And it was a business decision. And I really didn't have a lot of fun doing what I did. You know, I just did things to, I don't know, to maybe fill that void. And yeah, it was most all of it was to fill the void of, of football not being in my life anymore. So I'm not a Hollywood guy by any stretch of imagination. I'd rather be out here hanging out with my longhorns and and fishing and shooting guns, you know, truthfully. That seems like for me, you know, not knowing you personally as well, th that wouldn't appear to be the case just from seeing kind of what you do. It seems natural. Is that like, do you have to go to a different place to kind of have that energy and that persona? Like, did you have to put, I mean, was it all acting or is that just kind of like, is that kind of you a little bit or what, was it hard for you to, to get to that point? You mean acting? Just acting the fire. Yeah. The, well, I mean, even even in the in the ring, like you're fired up and the energy no, and man. just no. you know in, you're putting in, on in a show. Ring, in the ring was the biggest and best outlet I ever could have had. It was my drug at that time, um, because the only thing I ever aspired to do and play was professional football. Uh, I got the opportunity for a short period of time. I fulfilled a dream of mine, but it was definitely I didn't get satiated by any stretch. Um, I was lucky to get four years in the league, but you know, I, I I tore my abdomen off my pelvis. I was put on the supplemental draft list the first year that Carolina and Jacksonville were out. Carolina picks me. I end up asking to be cut because I was in no physical shape to to go up when you know physically I was kind of going down. So. I, I got a taste of it, which maybe made it worse for me. But, you know, I've always lived to be that guy. So wrestling was my outlet. And it was the way, ironically, for me to still tackle people on the football field and be as aggressive as humanly possible. And then truly be even more aggressive than I can be on the football field because it's acting to an extent. Um, but I, I was... Everything you see in the ring, everything you see me do in a movie, barring one or two things, uh, is me. It's an extension of me. And, and all of these ways, all of these things that I have done, whether it's being the donut maker or, you know, the chief donut maker for Dodge or being Santa Claus for Dodge or being Santa Claus in the movie. Shit, I got to kill people. I got to burn tires. I get to do cool <laughs> shit all the time. Mm -hmm, so yeah. it's just me. It's just me being me, man. And you know, the wrestling, I ramped it up a tiny bit. But I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy. It's just you got to bring it out in different situations. You are too. I mean, we all are. We all, you know, have that 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 animal in us when when you can ramp it up. Everything that That's we do in the public eye. It, is truly our, you know, we're wearing it on our sleeves. You know, you multiply it, and it's just a little bit different. Was there something along the way, though, where you said, no, that's too far for me? Like, I, obviously, there's a time you beat up a limousine, but, like, was there something where, like, Eric Bischoff or Vince McMahon came to you and you're like, no, that's, like, that's just too much. I'm not doing that. Not really. Uh, I, I can't ever remember something like that. I, I – I mean, I wasn't the acrobat by any stretch of imagination, so they didn't ask me to jump off a building and land on somebody, you know, <laughs> and do that kind of crazy stuff. I like to think that my physicality in, in the ring and, you know, in close proximity out of it was violent enough to to trade out for somebody doing something as stupid as jumping off a roof. 
you know, to get eyeballs. But um, eh, it really wasn't stuff that I really turned down. You know, I just didn't want to do any comedy. Uh, the, there are some characters that I'm really sorry. I don't care about. I don't care. There's certain things that you just don't do when you're a monster. So, um, and and not doing those things can continue to separate me from other normal characters because I just did. I never ever wanted to be like anybody else. Yeah. So then. Could you take me? I'm, I'm, I've heard this story before. I haven't heard your side of it, but there's like this famous story of Hulk Hogan calling Eric Bischoff and being like, I have to lose to Bill Goldberg. And you get in the ring with him. And at the time, Hulk Hogan, obviously like the most accomplished guy to get in the ring. And you're saying he's like leading you along the way, or it's kind of like a dance or something. Is that, is that, is that, am I retelling this right? Like where he's kind of holding your hand and telling you like, this is how you're going to beat me tonight or, or, well, I mean, you know, usually I, th th this isn't uh, like breaking the silent code by any means nowadays, especially with the Internet. But, yeah, usually you, you, you show up to work, you figure out who you're working with, you, you figure out the dance, you go through the routine to an extent. Uh, the, the, it, I mean, Jake, you, you know, I mean, it's the, the, there's certain guys that can go out and do it with their eyes closed, like completely. There's certain people who have to go through a certain routine. There's other people who have to, you know, invest a lot of time in training this dance to be able to perform it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I'd only been in the business six months. I walk into Hogan's dressing room and uh, I'm like, OK, you know, what, what would you like to do, Mr. Hogan, sir? You know, anything you want, sir. And he's like, ah, don't worry about a kid. We'll call it in the ring. I'm like, what? We'll call it in the ring. There's only 50,000 people out there. We're on national television. I know you know what you're doing, but I mean, I don't know shit. I didn't know anything. I was like a baby in that business. And so it's, it's just kind of terrifying knowing that you have to be this monster. You have, but you're nervous as hell and you don't know what's coming next. And I think I think a lot of what he did was set me up for the first headlock, and I, he pulled me in, and he's got icy hot all over his boobs, <laughs> which means that I can't see right the rest of the match. So whether that did was he set that up on purpose, or did he always have icy hot there? Ah, I mean, <laughs> you could you could look at it both ways because when you're of accelerated yeah. age, you try to get ready. As yeah best as possible so I can see that being a routine of his but I can also see you know guys like Flair and guys like Kurt Hennig and guys, the old school guys that would really rib you I mean you know you remember back in the day when baseball was a little bit different than it is now all sports were different than they are now you know especially I mean, you could still mess with people without without getting getting in trouble with the media or whatever. well yeah yeah so like when yeah older. so when he set that up you think he was like all right, i'm gonna i'm gonna see what this young guy's got i'm gonna see if he can handle the pressure yes i think that had i think there was a little bit of both in there but um it was hey man this this dude's an this dude was like god he still is in the business you know he set it up for guys like me to make a living um and, you know, guys like him and guys like Flair, and guys like Bret Hart and guys like, you know, that have been around a long period of time, they can do it with their eyes closed because it's something that's so natural to them. Um, so, I mean, you had one person at one end of the spectrum and one at the other. We met in the middle. You know, I was lucky enough to do it in front of kind of my home team, home crowd. Um, I had the Falcons come out and save me afterwards. I mean, it was poetic justice. It was the coolest night of my athletic life. But for reasons unbeknownst to other people, they thought it was because I won the belt or the title, but it had nothing to do with that. As appreciative as I was in that moment for the wrestling business, oh, no, the coolest part were having my teammates come out and want to be me because I wanted to be them my, the rest of my life, you know, so. 
pretty cool you've been able to bring your son back into that too. Sorry. I mean, it just it's really cool that you brought that now your son, even though he's going through his own athletic career, he got a personal taste of seeing dad do that and still gets a chance to see like exactly the impact you had. Um, I was 11 when you were doing this. So I, you were you're you still are like, a, I mean, it's just like you're a living God to me. So to be able to bring that back to your kid, and that's something Jake and I have talked a lot about this show, is that relationship and just like passing that on. Well, that means that means everything to me. You know, um, thanks for being a fan very much. I, I, I can't thank you enough, man. I did a lot of hard work and I tried to give back. And, you know, I wanted to be that superhero for kids. And there, there weren't that many people to look up to. And to look up to a professional wrestler, that's even, that's kind of an oxymoron. But I, I wanted to be that guy. I'd go on Maury Povich. I'd do the Make-A-Wishes. I'd, I'd be there for everybody. Hell, I just spoke at the, the Maccabi Games in San Diego, man, in front of 2,000 little Jewish kids, you know, from 12 to 16 years old. That's an honor that's been bestowed upon me that I can never explain how cool it is. You know, so as fictitious as the business is and as set up as it is, it still meant a lot to me, and it was my way to get to kids and, and, and you know, get to people and try to impart, you know, some wisdom upon them because football had been taken away from me, and that was my conduit. That was my vehicle. So I, I just kind of got out of a Trans Am and got into a freaking Dodge, you know, Viper and just went nuts. And... You know, I realized that as I was doing my Hall of Fame speech that my dream had been to be in the NFL Hall of Fame. But I truly believe that I was able to reach more people, more kids by being in the WWE Hall of Fame. As an athlete, that sucks for me because I wanted to be the man on the football field. But as a human, it's, it's extremely rewarding to me that I was able to accomplish something to a point where... I could make a difference in a, in a young kid's life. So to me, that's gold. Do you do any consulting or talent evaluating for wrestling today? Because I wrestling's changed in the sense of, I don't know really the big names in, in the game anymore. You know, it used to be like, it was Stone Cold, it was you, it was Undertaker, it was, it was Hogan, it was Mark Henry. It was, it was Nash. Like I knew, I knew every one of them, even though I wasn't like a diehard wrestling fan. What's, what's the state of wrestling like today in your mind? And I think it's exponentially different. It, I mean, there, there are not your mega superstars like there were back in the 90s, um, early 2000s when we were doing the, the Monday Night Wars. The reason for it, I don't know. Am I helping anyone consult at WWE? I'm still under contract at WWE till the end of the year. Uh, honestly, man... From a guy who 99% of the wrestling fans say can't wrestle, I think the last person that they're going to ask to consult anybody would be me. Um, but I truly believe that they need, the state of wrestling needs a lot of help. Um, uh, it's too much drama. It's, it's too much talking and not enough Brock Lesnar, you know, getting in a tractor and picking up the edge of rings and dumping you know, Roman Reigns. I mean, that shit right there is what got us on the map. That's what got us to beat Monday Night Football every freaking Monday. You know, doing stuff outside of the box, cool, badass guy shit. Well, the world is a different place. Now. All these monsters now, you know, the Lesners, like guys like you, they're trying to do something else first, right? Kind of like you did. Kind of like The Rock did and it didn't work out and now he's the most popular guy on the planet. So maybe, maybe that's part of it. Like guys are still trying to play in the CFL, the XFL, <clears throat> trying to make it to the NFL. And maybe if it doesn't work, maybe some of them will, tr will transition. But man, you're right though. I, being able to see a guy like Lesnar or someone like yourself in the ring again, shit, that would bring me back to wrestling. Well, I appreciate it. It's different. It's just totally different, man. You know, there's, it's, it's a lot of, it's quite indicative of, of, who we are these days of the kids these days of popularity and, and, and what makes you popular. And, you know, it's not what it used to be <laughs> by any means. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that is like an old disgruntled man. I mean, I, I, I deal with kids every day and it's, it's, it's a completely different freaking world, man. It's completely different. 
So yeah. uh, we have a responsibility. You sent me a video of your son, you know, doing that flag football stuff, man, romping it, kicking some butt. I Today, my son's starting football as a, you know, an incoming junior. We just got rid of baseball, got done with baseball 10 days ago. You know, that was the entire mm-hmm. summer. Um, and he's on the Texas 12, right? Yes, sir. Man, that that's a that's a badass organization. Well, and coming you know from you, here in Texas, you. man, they can they can really play. Uh, my son's playing for the 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 Outlaws, Lake Travis Outlaws. Re- really nice team. We're in the process of bringing some new kids in. It's just tough, you know. Parents, every parent thinks their kids the best on the team, and it's getting to that point. And you've you know with Gage, you've already experienced it. You can't. Every kid can't play shortstop. Every kid can't pitch every game. Sometimes you're going to have to sit the bench. So we're having that discussion with parents, and it can be uncomfortable. But And I tell them, look, I sat the bench at times. I wasn't always the best player on the team. So we're going to have to – it's not It's not all about you and your son. It's about the team. And we want to win. And you know how it is in here in Texas. If you're not trying to win, somebody else is going to kick your ass. Absolutely. And it's big team, little me. And it's and, the, and it's the qualities that we learned when we played that should be prevalent these days, and they're not. The fact is, is that sports gave me everything as a kid, a, a thousand percent. I, every life lesson I have learned has been through sports. And when you try to level the playing field in sports, that's so unrealistic because I don't see anyone leveling the playing field in life, right? And so at the end of the day, sports for me now is all about kids and their development and turning them into human being, good, good upstanding human beings, right, later in life. <laughs> uh, the way that it's turning now, it's, there, it, sports is not producing those people like it used to, Um because the standards are different, because the expectations are different, because the training's different, and because the coaches are complete, it's everything's different. You know, I see so much complacency now, it's not even funny. It's great to be a part of it, but oh, you don't need to win. Bullshit. You need to try your best 100% every single time you do an athletic endeavor, right? Because it teaches you there's always somebody that's going to win, there's always somebody that's going to lose in life. Right. And it's not always going to be sugar coated and people always can't hand you everything. And I mean, we live in a very affluent neighborhood, man, but it still does. It still means that you have to keep people accountable and you have to keep your kids accountable. And if you don't instill these values that sports gives us early in life, then you're doing them an injustice. And then it's it truly, and it's not about me as a parent. It's not about you, Jake, as a parent. It's not about anybody as a parent. It's about the uh, uh, long-lasting legacy that we can leave to our children so that they can be an extension of what we fought so hard for our entire life. And I'm very proud to say that my wife is a wonderful human being, and we've raised a pretty damn good kid. And I can't wait to you know, leave my legacy with him and see what kind of legacy he leaves uh, in an indelible impression upon the earth. But, you know, it's just even in Texas, man, I'm seeing a little bit bit of complacency in high school sports. And it's 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 disheartening. But I I think a lot of it has to do with where you are. And uh, a lot of it has to do with who you are. And I'm just I'm not going to put up with it anymore. I'm not if I see it. And it's my son. That that's one thing. If I see it, and it's somebody else, I'm going to say something about it because that's my opinion, and I believe it's I believe that's the right way to. Go. <laughs> Has that been an easy transition to be a to be a parent in sports? Then you know, I'm sure you've got dads coming up to you at practices and asking you for autographs or taking pictures or something where you're like, "Hey, that that's over here on dad mode now." Like that's always been a funny thing to connect with Jake about since we started the show. Is just kind of like you're showing up to coach. I went out and I watched Jake coach one of his big tournaments in Omaha, and just seeing like the passion and intensity it has with the kids and you know, being there with the first base coach and writing the lineup cards together. Like, but that's a place I imagine like you have to work to get to. Uh, was that easy for you after, you know, as you're getting out and like, you know, working with Gage? Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. There's no question. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I know what my role is, but I don't know how to accomplish being the best person in that role by any means. And as far as going to practices and going to games and, 
you know, I've been around this area for, for almost three years now. And uh, people are very used to seeing me at every athletic endeavor because I haven't missed a practice. I haven't missed a game. I don't, I can't do that. Right. And so I'm, I'm just like going to a baseball game and getting a hot dog. Now I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm normal protocol. Uh, I, oh, there's Goldberg. Oh, you can hear him now, you know, but um, I, I, it, it's different sometimes, but people have been extremely respectful and, and it's it's big big team little me man. I'm there for the kids, not just my son, for the whole team firing up firing them up before the game. And you know, I don't know, man. I'm an old school old school soul, and I'll always be set in my ways. And and I'm a perfectionist, and I like to win, and I like to be the best at everything, and I like to put the work in. And I'm just old school. And there needs to be much more of that these days. And, and whatever I can do to spread the word, then I'm, I'm fully in. Goldberg, and explain the importance to, there's a lot of parents and, and young athletes watching the show. Explain the importance of being a multi-sport athlete and not just being specific to, to one thing. And what have you seen from Gage and your experience in sports that tells you playing one, two, three sports as a kid is beneficial to their athletic career as they get older? Well, it's beneficial to them in their life, period, too. So it's, it's, it's multi, being a multidimensional human, whether it's uh, uh, cognitively, knowledge-wise, or athletically, um, you always should be multidimensional. Um, I mean, I played baseball, basketball, and football in high school, tried to juggle all three of them. Quite obviously, I wasn't very good at a couple of them. Uh, I loved baseball. My brother got drafted out of high school, you know, by the Reds as a catcher. Um, it's very important to cross train, uh, especially these days, a lot, especially here in Texas. It's amazing. Uh, baseball's huge. Obviously, everyone knows football's huge too, but baseball's got a pretty good damn foothold, especially here where I live. And I have not met one coach, whether it was a baseball or football coach, that wasn't in the corner of the athlete that was a multi-dimensional athlete that played both and even played three. You know, a lot of kids try to run track at the same time. Um, it's for so many reasons they're 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 great. It gives you options. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. It makes you yeah, a better you athlete. Burnt out. Um, I believe if you if you train properly and train smart, um, I don't see any negative. Well, I do see negative because I'm about to experience it. Um, if you you can't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Um, but if you but if you if you separate your eggs too finely, then I, I believe both um, entities, both sports, kind of suffer. You know, sure. so there's a there's a fine line in putting 75% of your, your focus towards this and then 25 in this. Well, what is the 25 enough to keep that going? And is the 75 enough to, sure. to be present in that sport? So, I mean, I'm dealing with it right this second. You know, thank God Gage got uh, picked for, to be uh, one, of the, one of the captains next year for his baseball team. Well, Frickin' football starts today, and we're talking about baseball yesterday. You and know? they're going to so play in the fall, I'm assuming. Passion, yeah, but they they're probably going to play tournaments. They need to understand that, you know, going to, I don't know, man. You asked me that question, and I'm trying to figure out my answer right now I in know. real time. Um, I know, I know. You know, because my son loves baseball more than anything on the planet. I mean, truly, almost as much as eating, but – um he, he loves it so much, and, you know, I want to hear him talk about it 24 hours a day because he's got that gleam in his eye, you know, and he's happy, and he's successful, and it's cool, and it's fun for him. But football's dangerous, and this kid's only played football. This will be his third year of playing tackle football. Now, we're in Texas, and he's 16 yeah. years old, and he's playing against kids who next year will be playing for major college football teams. And there's an issue with, with concussions. There's always an issue with physicality and 
you know, are you prepared? Well, for a kid that's six foot, 200 pounds and it's starting middle linebacker for, char you know, champion Bernie Chargers next year or this year, this week, um, it's a daunting task. It really is. And so it's tough to go from, to go, I think it's easier to go from base, from football to baseball than it is from baseball to football. Um, but then again, it's really tough to ever put baseball down because the people that he just played summer ball with, they won the 16U, you know, Texas tournament down in, in Tomball. Um, they're playing, they're playing fall ball, right? Yeah, it doesn't so stop. He sees it his does, teammates it playing going. fall baseball, continuing to do their thing because it was and a great the team. They had, you know, a good amount of success. And now he's transitioning into football. So it's a it's a it's a tug of war. Truthfully, at the end of the day, it's not about performance. I just don't we we just don't want him to get hurt. Yep. You know, I, I'm with I, you. I, I don't it, care about it. Yeah. I don't care if he ever plays football again. I just I don't want the kid hurt. You know, if he wants to play baseball the rest of his life, hey, go for it. I'm good with that. It's not like people aren't making, you know, tons of money in a in a sport that's not nearly as physical as playing professional football. Um, but it's just being smart. That's all it is, and it's it's to be to have a, a, a multi-sport athlete. Um, I mean, he wants to go to college and play both sports. This kid, you know. See now, that's that's where the delicate balance comes in because the choice at at a certain level, when you get to the highest level of competition or you climb, then the choice starts to impact you negatively because the people you're competing with will not have a choice. No you question. Know, you're going to get, and so that's where the duality comes in, but it's really the passion. That's where, but passion can override any of this, where it's, I want to prove to everyone that I can do both. Uh, the Bulldogs, Georgia Bulldogs, what do we say? A ba baseball, football for the youngster? Is that, would you want to see him go to your alma mater or? I talked to Coach Golf yesterday, who was, who was my head coach, who took over for Coach Dooley. And... He asks me, point blank, how's your son doing? I said, he's, he's doing great. Playing football? Well, coach, is he breathing? Yeah, he's playing football. Um, is he good? Well, this is my ex-head coach asking me, point blank, if my son is good <laughs> or not. And I could be a parent. I could be Goldberg. Or I could be a smart parent who is Goldberg and say, you know what, coach? This is his third year of football. He's got it in him. He's been training with Derek Johnson up in U up in Austin, you know, twice a week for God knows how long. He's been training with Chuck Smith in Atlanta at the pass rush camp. And he went to Georgia and did some training up there. And we've been doing everything and anything that we can. Coach Cav, uh, this 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 guy I brought in, he was he's he's just on his way to the airport now. You know, we wanted to prep gauge. It was like a, a like uh, cramming for the SATs, you know, Gage had to leave here at 545 this morning. And I think Coach Cav was the last one that said something to him. Um, so as parents, we just want to be responsible. As parents who played sports, we'd love to have people follow in our footsteps if that's truly what they want to do. So in a, an extremely 20 minute long dissertation to answer a question, um, I think playing multiple sports in high school is absolutely the thing to do. If you have the ability to do it and if you have the time to do it and you have the talent, most importantly, to be realistic in your goals of following up maybe later in life with both, I mean, that's, that's a hell of an athlete. I played with Dion when, you know, he played with the Falcons and then played with the Braves in the same day. Um, that's an unbelievable accomplishment. But... You know, at what point does one passion take away from the other to the point where, you know, your qualities drop down and you can't even qualify or make it in D1 or, or make it to a college level at that sport? I mean, you just, it's, it's a tough decision. It really is because, you know, it's hard enough for some people to make one sport, let alone two. That two is ridiculous, but doesn't mean we're not going to try but this, this is like the most important question I personally had. I wanted to know about the – you want to talk about changing gears here, Goldberg. 
we're completely changing gears here. I got to know the tat. Like, the, the, the barbed wire tattoo, if Gage comes home tomorrow with a matching tattoo, are you happy with him? Are you mad at him? Is this, is this something that you're – like, are you going to add to it in the long run? I just could – you, could you talk to me a little bit about, about the tattoo? It looks great, to be honest with you, seeing it here in person. Well, I appreciate it, man. It's, uh, it, was, it was a spur-of-the-moment thing back in the day. You know, I can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery, unfortunately. I'm tainted, but it's all good. I think I, I paid my dues. Um, yeah, that's something I haven't even thought of. If he comes home with a tattoo at 16 years old, I, I know his his mom would would uh, rip his skin off. Um, but hey, at the end of the day, I just we want him to be an individual. We don't want him to follow in anyone's footsteps, not mine included. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure in being the son of somebody who's in the public eye. And we just want him to be happy. That's it, man. To happy. If he doesn't ever play a sport and he's the happiest kid in the world, I'm great with that. Sports, although, like I said, the, the huge importance in sports is not only the confidence it gives you, but the life lessons that it teaches you. So. Amen. Amen. Um, this is a post note. We're waiting for Jake. Jay, I think Jake, something popped out. He wanted to come back and just say one last thing so we can tighten up the interview and, and wrap it. So I think that was like my last. I wanted to talk about the um, the tattoo. But um, while we wait, while we wait for Jake, I suppose um, is there is there a portion of you that would go back if you could get in a time machine and go back to your rise. Is there anything you would do differently? Like when you're 173 up and oh, would you speak up and say, I don't want to lose to Kevin Nash tonight? Or, or is there something where it's like, you know, maybe I would have spent more time technically training before they accelerated me into being like this international phenomenon? Um, no, I, I wouldn't have changed anything, truly, looking back on it. As far as the technical training is concerned, I just didn't want to be anybody else. Everybody else got there and they worked on chain wrestling. And they did this move and that move, and you knew what was coming next. And it was, it was entertaining, but it wasn't freaking jaw dropping. And it was, it didn't keep you on the edge of your seat like a Mike Tyson fight. And that's what I wanted to emulate. That's that's exactly what I wanted to duplicate. Was the feeling that I got when I watched Mike Tyson walk to the ring. And they gave me the ability to do that, you know, in a short period of time. I I wouldn't have changed it. Um, I mean, they they beat me on my birthday, man. That sucked. Absolutely sucked, the big giant. So, um, yeah, I would have said, let's do it like the next day. Not my birthday. But. Well, what I mean, was it tough? I guess, no. I Now I'm, I'm about to ask you an offensive question I was going to say. Having a birthday right next to Christmas must have been tough as a kid in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're going to come back and say, hey, dude, I already had Hanukkah. I had seven days of presents. Then you had a little time off, and then you're coming back for the birthday. So you might have had the ultimate cheat code there. Yeah, I know. It, 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 I don't know, man. It, it was all coupled the same time period of the year. and I got no presents, no attention, no nothing except for the month of December, man. It sucked. But, it, you know. It is what it is, man. We all uh, yeah. we play the hand that we are dealt. Mm. Well, you'll be happy to know that um, I logged approximately uh, like seventeen hundred hours one winter, just spearing people with you and WCW <laughs> versus NWO Nitro, in, in what could be described as the greatest winner in a, a young Barcelona Carl's life. Uh, Jake, we're just—I mean, it's like it, it, those are the moments, Jake. You were my—we grew up in that same time era. It was just the best. Um, it was unbelievable. And like I was saying before, the superstars in the, in the wrestling game back then, um, I, I, I miss that. I really do. Um, you were an idol to me, you and Stone Cold. And I was talking to my, my builder, who's actually, I think they're working on my internet now because it's, it's garbage. But he was saying, you know what? It was either Stone Cold or, or Goldberg. And was that kind of your experience with people? Like it was either either one or the other? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're two completely different, like human beings, but we also at the same time could be more alike. I mean, I don't that that's a that's an extreme oxymoron, and but it's true. Uh, our characters were completely different, but.
but who we are as individuals, you know, in a, in a way we're, we're quite similar. We, we, we want to go out and perform and do our thing, but when we're not out there, we just want to be on our ranch. We just want to chill. We just want to be invisible. Um, uh, he's, he's a really good dude. Um, he actually uh, is responsible for us being in the location that we're in. Uh, ultimately, the decision that we made had a lot to do with, with his influence and him being around this area. And, uh, hey, man, to back in the day, to have been compared to a Steve Austin, um, being a young little Jewish boy from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who wasn't in the business for very long and who never aspired to be in that spot, that was pretty damn cool, you know? Um, but yeah, the, those characters are gone as far as I'm concerned. There's a couple of them around these days, but it's, it's all in, it's all in the script writing. It's all in the building of the, of the, the human being. It's building of the, of the character. It's just what doesn't seem as if the work has been done to put those people in the spots that we were in back in the day. So it's a, it's a different place, man. I don't know what these kids are thinking these days. <laughs> <laughs> man, well, hey, I've, I've, got, I've got one more. I've got one more thing for you. I'm, I know you're a Dodge guy, and I love the content that you create, and I love that you're into cars. We're, bu- we're obviously both into firearms. But would you hold it against me if I told you I'm a Ford guy? No, man, I've got the coolest Ford in the world in my garage, the law, the lawman super boss. It's the only automatic boss 429 in the world. And my wife uh, drives, okay. uh, drives a 2017 uh, Super Duty turbo diesel that's a pretty fast truck. I mean, I can beat it in okay. our willies, but other than that, as she's yelling at me. Uh, no, man. No, no, no. I love cars, period. Um, okay. Yeah. Dodge is that much better than Ford. I mean, I can't say it all the time, but, you know, it's all good. Cars are cars. Yeah. So I just, car, cars are cars. I'm glad you say that. I was, I love them all. I just kind of grew up with a with, uh, giant Mustang fan. I just put an order in for the new Raptor, which I'm really glad they're going to finally put the V8 back in it. And compete with that TRX you got. Yeah, they need the V8. But, hey, the, you guys cornered the market for 15 years on that vehicle, right? And, I mean, you did a hell of a job. And the reason why the V8 went away was because there was no competition. Now there's competition. So it helps guys like us who are taking advantage of the fact that there's a horsepower war going on. And, you know, everybody wants to go electric. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a weird world. But taking advantage of it at this time. Dodge is coming out with like a 900 horsepower Challenger coming up soon. So, I mean, it's it's crazy times, but as a car guy who's been working on a garage for three freaking years, um, I'm excited, very much so. Yeah, me too. I, I think that electric cars are cool, but I need that sound, and I know you do too. 100%. I got to have When that. you get that Raptor done, bring it down here. We'll meet halfway up, man. We'll have a beer and do some do some range work and have a little bit of fun, man. I'd love to do that. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for your time, man. Really. And let's uh, – I'd love to get together, do a little baseball. Um, Definitely. And, and all that good stuff, man. Yeah, I'd love to work 100%. with Gage. And, if I can, and if I can ever help your kids in football or anything like that, anything we've got down here, man, just let us know, dude. It's an honor and a privilege, and let's hook up for sure because, you know, we're just hanging out right now. What's that um, website one more time, Bill? MadeGallant.com. Uh, G-A-L-L-A-N-T. And here we go. Here's these CBD gummies right there. Nice. If you're watching on YouTube. They haven't put me to sleep yet. No, but so they, we'll they made you chill, man. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks, Hello. brother. You we'll got it. My pleasure. Over. You guys, Jake, take care. Uh, keep in touch, man. You guys need anything, let me know. And, and thank you guys greatly. All right. That's Bill Goldberg. And um, I just love any part of the conversation where he was just tapping into being a monster. And just like, that's who he is at his core. He's a monster. Yeah. He was talking about how. Um, We've all got that inside of us, like that primal instinct, uh, that animal instinct. And he's right. And he showcased it for years and years and years. And uh, can't believe that he was he was in the in the ring as recent as, you know, a year or so ago. Just just incredible. 
And uh, it's nice to be able to see him be able to still walk around on his own two feet and not in a wheelchair after what he's put his body through. Oh, it's no joke, dude. Like, there's clips of him out there getting work on, and it's it's daunting to see and think about how much physical activity and beating that guy's taken over the years. It's also cool just, though, like, to connect on the human side and see, like, he's talking about just, like, being a good dad. He doesn't want his kid to get injured. It's it's really interesting to hear that a guy who's put himself through all that is like, no, I just want to make sure my son doesn't have to – as long as he doesn't get hurt. Yeah, I mean, you want to do anything you can to protect your kids. And w when you let them do certain things, uh, you know, football being one of those things, there's just always there's always risk. And it, and it can be scary, but you also don't want to restrict and prevent them from doing uh, certain things that they love or are passionate about. So it's it's a hard uh, it's a hard thing to to decide on. And, you know, I want Cooper to play football as long as he wants to. You know, and hopefully um, in, in the way football has changed, I mean, the the instruction uh, is, is much, much more detailed and specific uh, than it was when when I was young playing football. It's like, you know, there was no intro to pads and to tackling. It was just like, OK, here's here's your equipment. Strap it on and let's let's start knocking each other out. So, yeah, I mean, you, you never want to see your kids get hurt, but it's hard to tell them tell them that they can't play a sport you know yeah yeah I'm I'm with you too you brought up like I'd be so dialed into wrestling if they could give me somebody like that again like if there's somebody he was water cooler talking that's coming from a guy who wasn't at a water cooler in sixth grade but you know what I'm talking about like you you went to baseball practice and it was the boys in outfield like shagging flies like yo did you see Goldberg last night kill Booker T like yeah dude crazy <laughs> right crazy um any inter like have you ever thought about combat sports yeah i mean i do some uh jujitsu and you know some boxing stuff but i mean nothing nothing like competitive i just like it for you know the mental and physical challenge um i think jujitsu is probably the the most difficult type of cardio that i've ever done because you know when you're trying to prevent another grown man who's your size or or bigger uh, from doing dangerous things to you. Uh, it's, it's very, very exhausting. Uh, it's a humbling experience. It teaches you discipline, um, and, and self-control, but it also allows you to, uh, to develop, um, uh, a set of skills that can help you, you know, avoid potentially dangerous situations. And, and like I've, I've told you before, um, I, I don't look for violence, but I'm not, I'm not scared of it if it happens. So in being able to restrain somebody and put them in, in some sort of submission rather than having to, you know, fist fight, um, it could potentially save you a lot of, a lot of trouble and harm and, and maybe save someone's life. So uh, I highly recommend jujitsu to anybody who's, you know, has thought about it in the past and is maybe a little hesitant to get into it because they're nervous or scared. Uh, and the most difficult thing to do is just walk into the room. So if you can, you get the courage enough to, to just show up for the first day, uh, you'll be happy you did. And you'll, you'll learn a lot about, uh, about yourself and about how to protect, uh, protect yourself and, and your loved ones. So I highly recommend it, but no, I, I won't be doing any competitive, uh, fighting. Uh, I'll leave that for, uh, for the younger guys. Okay. We'll keep you penciled in though. Just tentatively, maybe a rough and rowdy on the line. It's like, you want to step in and square up against against maybe like Paul Bizonet or something or, or see, see how much pump you still got in that right arm of yours. Yeah. Yeah. I got, there's pump, there's pump in there, dude. There's pump. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to hit a lift right now. Hit a lift right now. What do you have like a, a day like today, Monday trap a little bit like trap spot or just the full body, full experience. See, see how that with the today. Yeah, I didn't I didn't work out much this weekend uh, in Chicago. So this will probably be, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes of cardio, getting the getting the engine running, start to sweat and then just just kind of hit, you know, two or three lifts, uh, upper body wise, two or three lower body lifts. Nothing, nothing super heavy, but just just a nice introductory uh, training session to get back into the week. Mm. Mm. I. Uh... I got to get back in the yoga studio. My wrist is healed now. Like it's, it's not, 
the the ligament structure or damage or whatever we're we're back to about 95 percent here so my um my downward facing dog it's gonna be there it's strong it's getting strong i'm i'm limber i'm loose i was hanging out with a couple of Good. uh pgi pga guys this weekend shout out nick hardy Good pgi yeah, i know i'm I'm struggling here, man. It's all good. My buddy finished 14th at the U.S. Open this year. He, uh, oh wow, he's, he's in town for his week. He just finished his rookie year on the PGA Tour, and he's going back to Scottsdale next week. So he's in Chicago for the week. He was out with the Saturday night. He brought his buddy Gio. He's on the European Challenger Tour, and the three oh, nice. of us are in the bar, and he's just like, we're just dry swinging. We're working on the triangle, the takeaway, the setup, posture. And so he's like, hey, come see me Thursday or Friday. Uh, he's going to be playing a practice round at his home country club in, in Illinois. So he's like, we got to get out and take some tips together. And I'm telling you, Jake, we're standing there having a, having a, having a cold one. And I'm like, yeah. you got to tell me, man, U.S. Open like Sunday. And he's like, okay, you want to know? He goes, there's 10 holes left. I'm three off the lead. I'm looking at the board. Like, You want to talk about one of the coolest stories, man, hearing it firsthand about him chasing it down and like – you know the ball striking that's necessary for a U.S. Open. Uh, that's that's uh. There's just something about being the PGA pro, like being a pro golfer on the PGA Tour at 26 years old, where like just the balls it takes to go out there every day and fucking grind. Um, so I'll keep you updated on how that round goes. I got a lot of confidence. Let me there. know. Like Let that. me know, man. I mean, golf's a tough one because it's like any given day, because all those guys can can go extremely low, but to to have the, you know, the confidence, the mindset, and the focus to get it done in those those big moments, it's just, it's it's another level of of, of competition, another level of professionalism, uh, and to just really respect their ability to go out there and do it, especially on a Sunday and come from behind and win a tournament. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. I just I wonder what it's like to square up a, a you know a golf ball more than a couple times around. I the sound. The sound and the feel, it just, it, you can't replace it. I mean, it's, you know, you, you've hit, you've swung a bat. It's like, you know, when you land on one and you don't even feel it hit the bat. It's a Dude, good he's, like, I got, he's like, I got 340 off the tee when I need it. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. And I can I, do that yeah. maybe once around, maybe once around. The rest are about 280 with a, with a heavy hook. And keep in mind, you're trying to do it every time too. So you're like one for fourteen. He's doing that. He's just ripping it. And those. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm a big not, guy either. I'm not swinging. I'm not swinging as hard as I can. And people think I do. I'm like, look, that's the way I move. I'm just an athlete. My hips, my hips fly through the zone. I just can't square the club face well enough. That's it. That's that. I just need more practice. But I don't. I don't have time to practice. Mm -mm. No. No. I got four hours maybe to play golf a couple days a week. That's it. Well, we'll be back on we'll be back on Thursday. We're working on a show for Thursday that's a little bit special, a little bit different. No, we we will not announce what that show is right now as we continue to work on it. Just be patient with us. Please continue to subscribe, share the share the episode. Thanks to Bill Goldberg. Thanks to our wrestling fans that showed up today. Um, he's a legend. It's just again, I got to pinch myself that we were hanging out with Bill Goldberg today. Love that guy. Superstar, uh, good show, man. Really enjoy the, the conversation with Goldberg as well. And uh, guys, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. And uh, we appreciate it. I got some Amex fraud alerts, so I got to get on the phone with an agent. People are trying to steal my shit. Fuck, man. That's what happens when you come That's all right. all right. I'll let you know how it goes. All right. Good luck, brother. We'll be back on Thursday morning. Everybody drive safe. We'll talk soon. Sounds good, man.